Upon entering the room, introduce yourself and confirm the patient's name and date of birth. Explain what the exam involves and obtain a patient's informed consent. Ask the patient if they're in any pain or discomfort before beginning the examination. It is important to wash your hands thoroughly to prevent the spread of infection. Ask the patient to stand up and expose their legs to the mid-thigh level. Begin the examination with inspection. With the patient standing and facing you, look for normal symmetry in the quadricep muscle bulk. Note any genuvalgum or genuvarus alignment of the knees. Ask the patient to turn around and inspect from behind. Look for normal muscle bulk in the hamstring muscles. Note any fullness or swelling in the popliteal fossa, which might suggest a Baker's cyst. To assess gait, ask the patient to walk a short distance, turn and walk back. Look for the smoothness and symmetry of movement, as well as any abnormalities of gait. Observe the patient's face. Note any discomfort. Ask the patient to lie supine on the couch. Test the integrity of the extensor mechanism by asking the patient to dorsiflex their ankle, locking their knee in extension, and perform a straight leg raise. Now continue inspection of the knee. Look for any skin changes or scars from previous surgeries. Assess the temperature of both knees using the back of your hands. Look for any signs of an effusion, which is a swelling within the knee joint. This can be tested for by performing either the medial gutter sweep test for a small effusion or the patella tap, which confirms the presence of a large effusion. Do only the test which is relevant. You don't need to do both. The medial gutter sweep test is performed by emptying the potential effusion from the medial side using a sweeping motion of your hand. The fluid is then pushed back into the medial side by performing a similar sweeping motion on the lateral gutter. Watch the medial gutter closely for the bulge of the returning effusion. The medial gutter sweep test is positive and confirms a small effusion if you see fluid returning into the medial side. For a large or tense effusion, one that is visible to the naked eye, you should perform a patella tap test. This is done by occluding the suprapatellar space with one hand and blotting the patella which lies on top of the large effusion with the other hand. Feel it bouncing on the fluid underneath it. The examination has now moved on to palpation. At this point you may choose to do some of the following particular patella tests. This will depend on what is relevant to a particular patient and a particular presentation. You will not do all of these tests in the same patient. If you suspect arthritis in the patellofemoral compartment, feel for the patellofemoral crepitations whilst asking the patient to actively flex and extend the knee. Another test which will confirm the presence of patellofemoral arthritis is the patella grind test. This test will be positive and produce pain if the patient has patellofemoral arthritis. So if you suspect this, perform a patella grind test by exerting a downward pressure on the patella, pushing it into the trochlea and translating it from side to side. Ask the patient if this causes them any discomfort, which would reflect a positive test. If you suspect patellar instability, with previous subluxations or dislocation, perform a patellar apprehension test by gently exerting a lateralizing pressure on the patella. Look at the patient's face for any signs of apprehension, which reflects a positive test. Now continue with palpation of the other anatomical landmarks around the knee. It is a superficial joint, so there's a lot to be felt. Ask the patient to flex their knee to 90 degrees. Palpate the tibial tuberosity and the patella tendon for any signs of tenderness, which would indicate patella tendonitis. Palpate the medial and lateral joint lines using a single digit. Begin anteriorly in the soft space just beside the patella tendon and work along each joint line separately. Joint line tenderness is typical of arthritis in which degenerative meniscal changes and tears are part of the disease process. However, if localised focal joint line tenderness is present in a young patient with a history of focal pain, suspect an acute meniscal tear. Perform Steinman's test to confirm this. Isolate the point of tenderness, and with the patient's heel in your hand, rotate the foot away from the affected side. That is, on the medial side, rotate the foot externally, and for the lateral side, rotate the foot internally.
Worsening of the patient's discomfort on this rotational movement is highly suggestive of an acute meniscal tear, and this reflects a positive Steinman's test. In degenerative meniscal tears, the Steinman test will be negative. However, degenerative and acute meniscal tears are usually easily differentiated in the history. In patients with a history suggestive of arthritis or generalised joint tenderness, a Steinman's test is not indicated. Now assess the collateral ligaments. Palpate along the origin, length and insertion of the lateral and medial collateral ligaments. Tenderness would suggest a strain. To test the integrity of these ligaments, abduct the hip and passively flex the knee to 20 degrees over the edge of the couch. Ask the patient to relax. Exert a valgizing force to test the medial collateral ligament. Exert a verizing force to test the lateral collateral ligament. Any discomfort or laxity again suggests a collateral ligament injury. Now move on to assessing the cruciate ligaments. Always start with the posterior cruciate ligament. To assess its stability, perform the posterior draw test. This must start by asking the patient to bend both knees and put their heels together on the couch. Ensure the normal relationship between the tibia and the femur exists by comparing both knees. Normally, the tibia sits slightly anterior to the condyles of the femur. If this is the case, you can confirm the PCL is intact by first sitting on the foot to stabilise the leg and then exerting a posterior force to the tibia, the posterior draw. With an intact PCL, no movement is seen. The posterior draw test is negative. In the case of a PCL injury, you will notice that the tibia will sit further back in relation to the femoral condyles. The tibia looks sunken. This is called posterior sag. You can then confirm the PCL injury by sitting on the foot to stabilise the leg and exerting an anterior force to the tibia. The tibia will then come forward and the normal relationship between tibia and femoral condyles will be restored. It will look like the normal contralateral side. However, when you then exert a posterior draw, it will move back to that abnormal position. This is a positive posterior draw. A visible posterior sag and then a positive posterior draw test are signs of a PCL rupture. The integrity of the anterior cruciate ligament can now be assessed using Lachman's test. Ask the patient to relax. Passively flex the knee to 20 degrees by grasping and lifting the femur with one hand. Then, with your other hand firmly grasping the tibia, thumb over tibial tuberosity, firmly and quickly lift the tibia, moving it anteriorly in relation to the femur. The ACL is a ligamentous rope running between the tibia and femur. With an intact ACL, you will feel either no movement or a firm end point to this movement, where the ACL will stop any further anterior translation of the tibia. However, laxity on the anterior draw test compared to the contralateral side reflects a positive Lachman's test and suggests ACL injury. Now finish the examination with assessment of range of movement. Assess the patient's range of active and passive flexion compared to the contralateral side. Record this range of movement in degrees. Finally, assess knee extension. With the patient in the supine position and using one hand to hold the knee flat to the couch, lift the heel on each side. If the knee won't go straight, the patient has a fixed flexion deformity, often associated with a moderate to severe arthritis. If the leg goes straight but the heel won't lift up, the patient can achieve full extension, often communicated as neutral. If the heel will lift from the couch, you can estimate the amount of knee hyperextension in degrees. Compare this flexion and extension to the other side. If you suspect a bucket handle tear of the meniscus in the patient you're examining, that would usually be a young patient with a twisting injury who is then unable to straighten their knee, who has unilateral joint line tenderness and a positive Steinman's test, you should perform heel height testing to look for a locked knee. A locked knee is specific to a patient with a displaced bucket handle tear of their meniscus. To perform this test, ask the patient to turn over and lie prone, with their knees at the edge of the couch and their feet hanging over. The weight of the feet pulls the knees into full extension. Compare the heel height for each side. If one heel height sits higher than the other, full extension is not possible on that side, and the heel height asymmetry is sign of a locked knee. Heel height testing is not indicated unless you suspect a locked knee is the problem, and so it's not indicated in every patient. 
The examination is now complete. Thank the patient and allow them to redress before explaining any relevant examination findings. Ensure you wash your hands before moving on.